Welcome once again to Auto Mundial, the weekly car news and reviews show, where this week we're looking at everything from EVs to performance SUVs. We have the new Volkswagen ID3, a car which VW is pinning its electric hopes on. And we have a pair of sports coupes with the newly facelifted Jaguar F-Type and the latest Porsche 911 Carrera. Also coming up, a massive American SUV from Ford and an all-new Aston Martin. First, though... Last year, the motoring world collectively lost its mind as Toyota finally revealed the A90 GR Supra, the long-awaited replacement for the legendary Japanese sports car. However, with its BMW straight six running gear and shared platform with the Z4, it has been dividing opinion and looks set to continue doing so with this, the new two litre version. On the face of it, it looks identical to the more powerful car, but under the bonnet, you'll find a turbocharged four cylinder engine producing 254 brake horsepower. It is still quick though. 0 to 62 miles per hour is dealt with in 5.2 seconds, making it just over a second slower than the 3 litre model. Top speed remains the same though, as both cars are limited to 155. With its smaller, lighter engine, Toyota claims that this new baby Supra will handle better than the six cylinder model, with its 100 kilo weight saving, providing perfect 50 50 weight distribution across the two axles. It'll be cheaper too, and easily quick enough to keep the pace with the hottest of hatchbacks. But if less weight and a smaller engine is your thing, the GT86 is still available. It's fair to say that Volkswagen's contributions to the car world have been significant, with three of the best-selling cars of all time, the Golf, Beetle and Passat, and strong sales everywhere in the world. When a company like VW decides to make an all-new electric car from the ground up, everyone takes notice. And while Volkswagen has dabbled with electric vehicles before with the E-Up and E-Golf, never before has it developed a proper EV platform. This then is the car VW is pinning its electric future on, the ID3. And let's start with the name. ID will identify all future electric cars built on this platform, with numbers 1 to 10 representing the size and body style. But while it's a shame that VW isn't continuing its long history of proper names rather than numbers, the 3 is also said to represent the brand's third era, following on from the Beetle and the Golf. Volkswagen is clearly expecting the ID3 to sell well then, with the VW Group aiming to sell up to 3 million electric cars a year by 2025. But while the Golf and Passat have sold in their millions, thanks in part to their conservative styling and sensible image, the ID3 is a little more out there. It's about the size of a Golf, but that's where the similarities with its petrol-powered stablemate end. With no need to fill the front end with an engine, the floor-mounted batteries have allowed designers to rethink the way a car should look, much like Jaguar has done with the I-Pace. The wheelbase is longer than a Golf's, but it has short, stubby overhangs, meaning it gains no noticeable length or width. But despite its futuristic appearance, VW hasn't gone over the top. It still looks like a pretty normal car, with no crazy exterior lighting or cameras instead of wing mirrors. That's just not VW's way of doing things, as it knows that the secret to success is building cars with mass appeal. And this continues inside, where you're greeted by a masterclass in understatement. It's bang up to date and suits the car, but at the same time, it looks and feels as if it could belong to just about any other car in the VW range. The clean dash is dominated by a big central infotainment screen, like pretty much any other car in 2020, and it has a digital instrument display in place of traditional dials. In fact, the only real giveaway to its electric underpinnings is the lack of central gear selector, 
with forwards and reverse instead being selected via a switch on the instrument pod behind the steering wheel. Thanks to the flat door and lack of engine, there's loads of cabin space. There are cubby holes and storage bins all over the place, while the legroom in the back is more similar to that of a Phaeton than a Golf. So while the design is modern and eye-catching both inside and out, it isn't in your face. Think of the styling as a halfway house between the futuristic BMW i3 and the rather plain Nissan Leaf. The ID3 really does have an identity of its own. But the ID3 has another ace up its sleeve, its range. Neither the i3 or the Nissan Leaf will manage 200 miles on a charge, while the Volkswagen can hit up to 342, depending on which version you go for. Even the base models with the smallest batteries are capable of over 140 miles though, making this a real alternative to a conventionally powered Golf. In fact, this really could be the car that makes EVs the norm. It's available with a range of different range and power outputs, while prices aren't expected to be much more than the equivalently spec Golfs. So will this be the next VW to enter the best-selling car list? We certainly think so. America loves its SUVs, and naturally in the land of biggest is best, it's the larger models that grab their headlines. This is the 2020 Ford Expedition, and by European standards at least, it's massive. It has three spacious rows of seating, a huge boot, and bold styling that's guaranteed to get you noticed. We know we shouldn't, but we really rather like it. Under the bonnet, or hood in this case, you'll find a twin turbocharged 3.5-litre V6 that powers either the rear or all four wheels via a 10-speed auto box. There are various trim levels on offer, with this, the King Ranch, being the coolest. The name itself is good enough, but look at the goodies you get with it. 22-inch wheels, Del Rio leather upholstery and real wood trim. Nice. Base models start at $54,000, while the top spec King Ranch and Platinum models are $74,000 and $75,000 respectively. That may sound quite a lot, but this is a lot of car. The V6 is available with two power outputs, 375 or 400 horsepower, depending on your trim. And while neither is hugely fast, the Expedition is a great tow car, something that's very important in the States. It can tow well over four tons, more than any of its rivals, and yet Ford still claims a respectable 24 combined miles per gallon. Inside the plush cabin, the big Ford is every bit as spacious as its dimensions would suggest. There's leather everywhere, but it is let down by acres of nasty, cheap-feeling plastics. It looks good, though, with a big square dashboard matching the exterior styling. All models get an excellent 8-inch infotainment system with every bit of connectivity and smartphone compatibility imaginable. There's also an option to upgrade to rear seat entertainment screens, perfect for long interstate journeys. Better yet, it's packed to the rafters with safety tech, with all the autonomous braking equipment and active warnings you can imagine. However, this is a hotly contested class and the expedition isn't without its rivals. Chief among which is this, the Lincoln Navigator. Sharing much of its underpinnings with the Ford, the Lincoln wraps up the same V6 in a much more luxurious package. From the moment you set eyes on it, you can tell this is a somewhat more decadent option. With its huge chrome grille and fancy headlights, it appears to be more of a Mercedes rival than a Ford one. However, in its lowliest trim level, it's about the same price as a Platinum Edition Expedition. But what does it get that the Ford doesn't? Well, its cabin is much more luxurious, with gorgeous materials and beautiful design. Out on the road, though, it's not much different from the Ford. So how about this? The Expedition's oldest rival from Ford's oldest rival, the Chevrolet Tahoe. It may be cheaper than the Ford and much cheaper than the Lincoln, but it packs a bigger punch thanks to a pair of available V8s. 
The smaller one feels a little weak, but opt for the full-fat 6.2 and you'll soon see the Ford as nothing more than a speck in your rear-view mirror. And while the interior is a far cry from the Lincolns, the amount of gadgets available is mind-boggling. The options list seems to go on forever, with wonderful things like Bose audio and big screens for the rear seats and extra USB ports on top of the five standard ones. It has tons of storage too, and really is the most practical car in its class, if you can forgive the cheap feeling cabin quality. Of course, none of these cars makes any sort of sense outside of North America, but the fact that we can't have them over here in Europe just makes them all the more appealing. With our sensible hats on, we'd recommend the Chevy, but for its sheer opulence, we'll take the Navigator. Still to come, Aston Martin's first ever SUV and the latest Porsche 911. Coming up, the new Jaguar F-Type, but first... At first glance, this new DBX from Aston Martin may seem like just another example of a premium sports car brand cashing in on the SUV trend. Porsche has done it, so has Lamborghini, and even Ferrari is planning a 4x4 for release next year. But for Aston, the DBX is more than just a cash cow, as it could well be essential for the struggling company's survival. With profits and share prices falling in 2019, a popular SUV could be just what the historic British brand needs to secure its future. However, this is new territory for Aston, so how have they got on? Well, from the outside at least, the DBX is refreshingly good looking for a car in this class. It gets a proper Aston grille, more traditional than the recent ones we've seen on the latest Vantage, and DBS Super Legera. In fact, despite its four doors, high ride height, and general SUV-ness, it does actually look like an Aston Martin. At the back, you find a slightly incongruous Vantage-style ducktail spoiler that we reckon will take some time to get used to, but there are other subtler Vantage-inspired details. The exhausts, for example, are surrounded by perforated mesh, and a full-width taillight follows the contours of the spoiler. It's certainly the best-looking car in this class, although that isn't necessarily that hard when the competition is Bentley Bentegas and Porsche Cayennes. But these are established competitors that the Aston will need to beat. The Bentley is hugely fast and just as luxurious, while the new speed model is now the fastest SUV in the world. The Porsche, meanwhile, was one of the original performance SUVs. The Turbo SE Hybrid blends economy with performance, with the hybrid-assisted V8 producing the same amount of power as the Aston. The DBX uses the same AMG-derived engine as the Vantage, but this time the 4-litre V8 has been tuned up to 542 bhp. 0 to 62 miles per hour is dealt with in just 4.5 seconds onto a top speed of 181. That should be the S in SUV taken care of then, while elsewhere it's as roomy and plush as any of its rivals. In fact, the cabin is possibly the best in Aston's current lineup. It still uses the same peculiar design language, but it suits the DBX more than it does a DB11. With Aston's recent struggles, the DBX really needs to work. And to some extent, the brand has put all of its eggs in the SUV basket, having built a brand new factory in South Wales for its production. But we do think it will be successful as a gateway into Aston Martin ownership, and at the very least, it's a lot better looking than a Bentayga or Cullinan. If you're in the market for a Porsche 911, it can be easy to get confused by all the different versions. There are Carreras, Turbos, Fours, S's, GT's and Targas. To be honest, 
it can be quite complicated for those who don't spend their spare moments on the online configurator. But since the latest 992 generation was launched last year, there are, for now at least, only four to choose from. The Carrera, Carrera S, 4 and 4S. More powerful, faster variants are on their way, but the entry point into 911 ownership will always be this, the Carrera. But just because this is the cheapest version, don't think that you're missing out on any of the 911's talents. It still gets the same 3-litre turbocharged flat 6 as the other models, and like the S version, is driven by the rear wheels only. It's less powerful than the Carrera S though, with 380 brake horsepower rather than 444, but they look virtually identical. The standard Carrera comes with smaller alloys, but we'd hazard a guess that most owners will spec bigger ones anyway. Speaking of options, this being a Porsche, there are loads to choose from. There's a sports chrono pack which, along with adding a stopwatch to the dashboard, shaves two tenths of the 0-62 time to four seconds flat. Then there's a sports exhaust, the nose lift kit, carbon ceramic brakes, etc, etc. Before you know it, your budget model 911 ends up costing as much as something way higher up the food chain. We recommend keeping it simple. The Carrera doesn't need all the trinkets and distractions. It's still a proper 911. After all, in standard form, it can still hit 62 in 4.2 seconds on its way up to 182 miles per hour. And with a base price of just under £83,000 or US dollars it's by far the cheapest car in the range. However, at that price point, it has some serious competition in the form of the beautiful Jaguar F-Type. For Carrera money, you can get a highly specced V8 model with more power and, despite the Porsche's compact rear seats, more practicality. But the recent facelift can't hide the Jag's age, especially compared with the new 911. Alternatively, there's this, the latest Aston Martin Vantage. Another front-engined British coupe, the baby Aston oozes glamour with its long bonnet and sculpted rear end. It's sensationally quick too, with its Mercedes-derived V8 pumping out 503 brake horsepower, far more than any current 911. Despite that though, Performance is on par, with the Vantage hitting 62 from rest in 3.7 seconds. However, it's much pricier than the Porsche, and it simply can't compete for interior design or quality. A car that certainly can match the Porsche's quality, though, is this, the Lexus LC500. Focused more towards grand touring than the sportier 911, the LC500 is still a wonderful car that matches the Carrera for price if not performance. It may have a 471 brake horsepower V8, but this big, heavy coupe takes 4.7 seconds to hit 62 miles per hour from rest. There is a V6 hybrid model too, which is only marginally slower and much more economical, although we don't imagine many buyers in this class are too worried about miles per gallon. It seems then that the basic 911 Carrera still offers the perfect blend of value and performance. The Carrera S is certainly a more impressive car, but we're not sure if it's worth a 10 grand premium. So for now at least, the Carrera seems like the 911 to go for. The Jaguar F-Type has always been beautiful. With classic curves mixed with modern details, it really is a 21st century E-Type. It's one of designer Ian Callum's greatest hits. So when Jaguar recently decided to give it a facelift, we'll admit to being a little nervous. So here it is then, the 2020 Jaguar F-Type. And clearly, we needn't have worried. It's got a brand new face with the old slightly awkward wing-mounted headlights making way for some much sleeker horizontal ones positioned lower in the bumper. Inspiration has clearly been taken from the rest of the current Jag range with more than a hint of XC in the new larger grille. Inside though, the car remains largely unchanged with subtle improvement to fit and finish and some more upmarket leathers and plastics. 
buyers will no longer be able to opt for the wonderfully loud and characterful V6 with the manual gearbox also being dropped. Thankfully though, the glorious supercharged 5 litre V8 remains and once again can be had with the rear wheel drive. An all-wheel drive variant is also available to keep it competitive against the endlessly configurable Porsche 911, while the 300 horsepower turbocharged four-cylinder remains as an entry point. However, things don't stop there. The range-topping R model has been given a boost, with its V8 now producing 567 brake horsepower and some chassis tweaks to boot. It's also available with optional carbon ceramic brakes. It'll be good for 0 to 62 in 3.7 seconds, with top speed limited to 186 miles per hour. While the F-Type platform may be getting on a bit now, it's still as gorgeous and as tempting as ever. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we feature a new performance car from Audi, the Ballistic RSQ3, an SUV with hot hatch speed.